Welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County's Curator's Corner. I'm Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. Uh, we are located in Glen Cove, New York, and this is an online program that's part of a regular series of virtual programs that look in detail at particular objects in our museum's collection. We started these virtual programs when our building was closed back in April as a way to draw attention to the items in our museum. I continue to hold the programs, however, but I'm delighted to report that our building is open to visitors. And I encourage you to come and make an advanced reservation. We ask people to make an advanced reservation if possible, uh, because we are adhering to strict guidelines to ensure social distancing in our galleries. But we will do all we can, we can to accommodate walk-in visitors as well. So give us a call, send us an email, and arrange to see in person some of the objects that I've spoken about in these virtual programs and that I'm going to talk about today. One more comment before I go to today's topic, and that is, as always, I encourage you to pose any questions you have in the Q&A box. So uh, scroll your mouse around, find that Q&A box, click the button, and then type in your questions. I'll look for them. Either I'll respond during the program, or more likely, I'll wait until the end of the program and then get to them. But please type them in. Today, I'm going to talk about this photograph in our museum taken in Auschwitz in May of 1944. And here let me say that this curator's corner is a bit of a heavy one. I'm going to be showing pictures from Auschwitz and talking about the, na the Nazis mass murder of Jews. This is a painful topic and some of the images I will admit are probably going to be difficult to look at. From one perspective, you might think it would be better not to bring some of this stuff up and instead to focus on other aspects of the Holocaust, like rescuers or um, uh, resistance or liberation, rebellion. But I think it's important to confront, confront the horror of what the Nazis did um, and in that way to honor the victims who suffered through it and to remind ourselves what we can not ever let happen again. So I hope you'll bear with me and explore some of this dis difficult history together. Just trying to get my camera situated. Seems off center. Okay, let me, uh, oh, here's the caption that we show with our photograph. Um, it says, when prisoners arrived at Birkenau, all their possessions were taken away. Here, Jewish prisoners sort through piles of confiscated shoes which eventually were sent to Germany. Let me back up and clarify that uh, Birkenau was a part of Auschwitz, perhaps the most infamous Nazi camp. Auschwitz was a strange hybrid camp in the Nazi concentration camp system, serving both as a slave labor camp and as a killing center. Here you can see the location of the six Nazi killing centers. Aside from Madonik and Auschwitz, the other four camps, Helno, Belgitz, Treblinka, and Sobibor served no other purpose than mass murder. Trains arrived with deportees who were brought directly to gas chambers where they were murdered. There was no sorting or selection. Essentially, everyone who went to those camps was killed. The numbers of survivors from those killing centers are shockingly small. Of the 172,000 Jews sent to Helno, less than 10 survived, 10. Of the 450,000 Jews deported to Belgium, only five survived the war. At Treblinka, 925,000 Jews arrived in deportation trains, only 70 or so survived. And of the 170,000 Jews sent to Sobibor, only about 50 survived, so a handful out of millions. Auschwitz, however, was different, as was Madonik, although on a smaller scale. Thousands did survive in Auschwitz because it was both a labor camp and a killing center. The first camp at Auschwitz entered through these infamous gates with the misleading statement that work could set people free, was opened in April of 1940, initially housing Polish political prisoners and then after the German invasion of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, it also served to house Russian POWs. 
It was only in the wake of the invasion into Russia and the Nazi decision to enact the final solution, the murder of European Jewry, that plans were enacted to add a killing center to the Auschwitz concentration camp. In October of 1941, construction started on a massive expansion of Auschwitz with the building of a second, much larger camp about three kilometers from the initial location in the neighboring village of Brzezinka, which the Germans called Birkenau. You can see on this German map how close the two villages were, and you might also note the massive railroad lines that run right through the area. And while there had been a small gas chamber built in Auschwitz I, it was in Birkenau that the Nazis would build their largest gas chambers and crematoria, enabling the Nazis to murder 1.1 million people at Auschwitz before the camp was liberated in January of 1945. Even as the Nazis turned Birkenau into a killing center, however, they continued to also operate Auschwitz I and Birkenau as a slave labor camp. When trains arrived at Birkenau, in most cases, the deportees were put through a selection process. The very young, the old, and the sick were sent to the gas chambers. But those deemed fit enough to work were separated out for hard labor with the goal of draining every last bit of their energy before they were killed. I should add that a third camp was also built called Manowitz. It was added in 1942, housing slave laborers working mostly in the massive IG Farben synthetic rubber plant, the Buna. This aerial photograph, a reconnaissance photograph taken in June of 1944, gives a sense of the scale of the three Auschwitz main camps. In the center of the image, you can see the town of Auschwitz that the Germans called Auschwitz and thus gave its name to the initial Nazi camp. To the left, can you see that? Yeah, to the left, uh, just over the Sola River, you can see the initial camp, Auschwitz I, which grew to hold between 12 and 14,000 prisoners. Monowitz, visible here, could house a further 10,000, mostly for, as I said, people working in the factory area behind it. But Birkenau grew to accommodate 90,000 prisoners with plans to expand it further to house maybe up to as much as 125,000, so on a different scale than the other Auschwitz camps. This is another perspective. It's been rotated, but you can see in yellow the three different main camps, and you get a sense of the different scale of Birkenau, so much larger. The photograph that we show was taken in Birkenau and hints at the massive scale of Nazi genocide. 1.3 million people were sent to Auschwitz from all over Europe. And you can see here the broad catchment area for Auschwitz compared to the other Nazi killing centers. In an effort to make deportations to Auschwitz more orderly and to prevent uprisings or hysteria, the Nazis did all they could to hide the fact that those being sent to Auschwitz were, being, were not being sent to their deaths. Or sorry, they were hiding the fact that they were being sent to their deaths. To that end, most were told that they could bring sometimes up to 100 pounds of luggage, using this lie as a way to convince the Jews that they were being resettled rather than sent to their deaths. But this also meant that each trainload of victims brought along thousands of pounds of clothing, dishes, linens, photo photographs, shoes, suitcases, and much more. When the people arrived at Auschwitz most, about 960,000 of the 1.3 million deported there, were sent directly to the gas chamber. Their possessions, along with the possessions of those selected for work, were stolen by the Nazis, but needed to be sorted and organized. The bags were taken from the trains, loaded onto trucks, and then taken to be sorted and stored in warehouses in Birkenau. Our photograph fits into this sequence and shows prisoners sorting the massive pile of shoes. I want to look a little bit more closely at this photo. One of the things that strikes me about it is the large number of prisoners doing the sorting. I count around 30 women just in our one photograph, and they were the tip of the iceberg. By 1944, more than 2,000 prisoners were needed to sort through the possessions of those being murdered at Auschwitz. 2,000 prisoners just working on sorting. You can also make out 
a wagon load or pile of suitcases on the right hand side of the image, perhaps from new arrivals and in need of sorting and emptying. The sad fact is that in the spring and summer of 1944, between two and five deportation trains arrived in Auschwitz every day, each bringing thousands of Jews who were to be murdered and thousands of pounds of luggage to be processed. One more item in the foreground is a sort of carrying container. You can see it's meant to be carried by two or perhaps four prisoners. It's a reminder, I think, that there were no conveyor belts or sorting machines. The Nazis relied on manual labor from its prisoners to sort, move, and organize the literally tons of possessions that were moving towards Auschwitz. And of course, the most obvious thing in the photograph are the shoes. You can see the women sorting through them to find matching pairs and to separate those that are in good enough condition to send back to Germany or perhaps to use in the camp. Shoes turned out to be a critical item for a prisoner's survival in Auschwitz. One survivor wrote, our shoes were so important to us. If our heels were rubbed raw or we got bit blisters on our feet, it became impossible for us to march in step and remain at the required distance from one another. The slightest deviation from the perfect order was sufficient to attract the attention of the capo. The smallest injury could easily become infected. Since we were on our feet from morning until late at night, a small poor healing wound could soon become a major problem. So we all knew how important it was to guide our shoes like treasure. Some of you I'm sure are familiar with the display of shoes at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington DC or perhaps in Auschwitz. There's something particularly powerful about the piles of shoes which not only convey the, sca convey the scale of the killing but also something the humanity of those who were killed. The poem by Moshe Schulstein captures some of the horror conveyed in our photograph. We are the shoes, he wrote. We are the last witnesses. We are shoes from grandchildren and grandfathers from Prague, Paris, and Amsterdam. And because we are only made of fabric and leather and not of blood and flesh, each one of us avoided the hellfire. A powerful poem, I think, and connected to what our picture shows. Let, let me go back to our picture, actually to this aerial reconnaissance photo. This taken during an Allied bombing raid in September of 1944, the second of what would be four bombing raids on the IG Farben works and the Monowitz camp. And it shows the layout of Birkenau's camp in some detail and gives us clues about where our photograph was taken. You can see the train tracks that were extended right into the camp in 1944. You can also see the large scale gas chambers and crematoria labeled two, three, four, and five that went into operation between March and June of 43. Gas chamber number one was located in Auschwitz I, a much smaller facility. Prisoners, oh, whoops, and you can see the storage warehouses, the area that the prisoners called Canada because like the nation of Canada in North America, it represented a land of plenty, where there were bountiful supplies of all kinds. I have to admit that to an American, it may seem strange that the Polish residents and other prisoners in Auschwitz associated Canada as the land of plenty rather than the United States, but that appears to have been the case. Rosie and Lily Berkowitz, two Hungarian sisters from a portion of what now is in the UK, uh, offered the following testimony after liberation about working in the Canada unit. This was an enviable place, they said. One could have some extra bites of food and did not need to starve. We sorted through the luggage that the transports, transports brought here. We always found food in them, which we could secretly seize. This saved us from starving to death. Another member of the so-called Canada Commando who was 16 when she was liberated testified one could find everything here, starting with clothes, food and bedclothes, to the most expensive jewelry, since everyone, uh, most expensive jewelry, precious letters and photos. 
we saw the most beautiful things since everyone brought the best belongings they had because no one thought that even that last rucksack would be seized. People thought that they would be able to hide stuff in their luggage, but even that last rucksack, even that last hidden suitcase was opened and they found the contents. On some occasions, prisoners working in the Canada area found luggage from their own family members and were forced to process their own family's possessions. Another survivor knew that she was lucky to work in Canada, but described the conditions as awful. The crematorium, she said, was in front of us and we could see how they selected each transport that arrived. We could see the elderly and children entering the gate of the crematorium. We could hear the horrible screams, but we never saw anyone coming out. A look back at our photograph shows several chimneys from the crematoria in the background, giving us a clue, again, about where exactly this photograph was taken. If you look at the overhead photograph, and particularly the location of Canada compared to the crematoria and try to match up the angles from our photograph, I think it likely that our photo shows gas chamber number four, which had two chimneys, and gas chamber number five, meaning that our photograph was taken somewhere right in this area. One other clue is the cloud of smoke in the background of our photograph, which does not appear to be coming out of the chimneys. We know that our photograph was taken in May of 1944 during the Hungarian deportations. Between May and July of 1944, 430,000 Jews were deported from Hungary to Auschwitz. 75% of those Hungarian Jews, more than 325,000 people, were sent directly to the gas chambers. This horrific period is what the Nazis had prepared Auschwitz for. But during some of those months, the number of people killed in the gas chambers exceeded the capacity of the crematoria. As a result, the Nazis ordered pits to be dug outside gas chamber number five, where additional bodies were cremated in the open air. It seems likely that the smoke seen in the background of our photograph is from outdoor pits from behind crematoria number five. A disgusting clue, but one that also shows the value of our photograph in confirming the crimes of the Nazis. Ironically, the photograph was taken by a Nazi himself, an SS photographer, who took a series of photographs that were found after the war in a album that's now known as the Auschwitz album. Our photograph was one of almost 200 pictures included in that album. It appears that the photographs were taken and put together at a, as a presentation volume for the relatively new camp commandant, Richard Baer, who presided over the mass murder of the Hungarian deportees. But because of when they were taken, they document the arrival, selection, and processing of several transports of Jews from an area now part of the Ukraine that was part of Hungary. The photos in the album show the entire process for dealing with new arrivals at Auschwitz, except for the killing process. The album was actually found after the liberation, after the end of the war, by Lily Jacob, herself an Auschwitz survivor. Lily came from Bilki, in what's now in the Ukraine, in the spring of 1940, her family was re relocated from their hometown to a transit ghetto. And then on May 24th, 1944, they were deported to Birkenau on a transport. Lily, who was 18 years old when she arrived at Auschwitz, was on the only member of her family to survive. Lily was forced on a death march out of Auschwitz in January of 1945 and eventually was liberated from the Nordhausen concentration camp where American soldiers found her sick with typhus. The American GIs placed her in a former SS barracks where they hoped she could recover. And it was there in that former SS barracks in Nordhausen that she came across the album of Auschwitz photographs while searching for some food and clothing. Amazingly, Lily quickly realized what she was looking at because she saw photographs of her own family and even herself on the pages of that album. 
the photographs had captured her deportation train arriving at Auschwitz. The SS photographer ended up providing her with the only pictures of her family that she would have. She kept the album and took it with her to Prague, where she lived temporarily after the war. Lily allowed the Jewish community in Prague to copy some of the images and produce a set of glass negatives to help others track down what happened to their family members. In the 1950s, those negatives were discovered by some Czech researchers, but Lily had moved away and nobody knew what had happened to the original album. Finally, in 1961, during the Eichmann trial, Lily, then living in the United States, gave an interview to Parade magazine where she mentioned the album that she had found in Nordhausen. Staff members of the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum read the interview and contacted her, finally linking the glass negatives with the original album. In 1980, Lily donated the album to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum and Memorial in Israel, and they later republished the photographs and have made them much more widely available. Our photograph and the rest of the album offer an invaluable view into the operations of Auschwitz. They are primary sources offering evidence of the Nazi genocide, and they capture the last moments of life for thousands of Jews who had survived until May of 1944. As to the Canada warehouse, on January 23rd, 1945, as the Red Army approached Auschwitz, the, Canada, the SS set the Canada warehouses, filled with whatever the Nazis had not been able to ship westward, on fire, along with the crematoria and the gas chambers, as a way to hide the evidence of the crimes they had been committing. Um, so still full of goods, the warehouses apparently burned for five days and were still ablaze when the Red Army entered the camp on January 27th, 1945. Some possessions were later found in other warehouses to give um, the military a sense of what had been in these storehouses. Also testimony provided some evidence along with photographs like ours. In fact, it's photographs like ours that capture what took place in Auschwitz and that's their value. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for watching. And of course, if you have questions, please type them into the, the uh, Q&A window. Before I try and answer them, let me put in a plug for some other upcoming programs. Uh, on Monday, November 9th, we're asking you to join us in marking the anniversary of Kristallnacht, the Kristallnacht pogrom of 1938. In conjunction with the March of the Living's Let There Be Light initiative, HMTC is seeking to place candles in the amphitheater in our children's memorial garden. We're looking for people to sponsor some of those candles and help us light up the night. So please go to our website, sign the pledge to keep your lights burning on Monday night to honor the anniversary of Kristallnacht, and then click on the button to sponsor a candle at HMTC. On next Wednesday, November 11th at noon, we are celebrating Veterans Day by holding a program with Rick Beyer, president of the Ghost Army Legacy Project, who will talk about the once secret military unit and its connections both to Nassau County and to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. The program is going to include the sharing of a flag that comes from HMTC's collection, which earlier this year we discovered was from the Ghost Army. And one more to mention, on Tuesday, November 17th at 6.30 p.m., join us for the culminating program in our Yiddish Culture Festival, a performance by actor and educator Bob Spiato about the life of Shalom Aleichem, the Yiddish author and playwright best known for crafting the stories that became the basis for Fiddler on the Roof. I hope you'll join us for these and other programs. You can find a full list on our website at www.hmtcli.org. Click on the events tab. And once again, let me ask you to support our virtual programs by making a donation on our website. I know it's become common to think of virtual programs as free, but we rely on your donations to continue our operations. So please click on the Give Now button on our homepage. Okay, let me look and see if you've got some questions. Ah, one question is, can you see the Auschwitz album online? And you can. Uh, the Auschwitz album 
just do a search. Yad Vashem has not all 197 photos, but they have a number of the photos scanned and you can see them online. It's on the Yad Vashem web website, but you can do a Google search and you'll find it. Um, just seeing, I think there's another questions. Oops. Uh, anyway, so let me see the same question. Okay, well, thanks very much for tuning in today. And I hope you have a pleasant week. And I look forward to seeing you at some of our other programs very soon. Thanks very much. Take care.